it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce to you Dr. Andrew Rundle. Um, Dr. Rundle has uh, been at the Columbia University School of Public Health, Mailman School of Public Health and Medical Center for the past almost 25 years. He comes to us with a great experience and uh, leadership. Um, he is the director of the Built Environment and Health Research Group at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. He's also professor of epidemiology and project leader for the Social and Spatial Epidemiology Unit in the Mailman School of Public Health. Uh, he, he in, this, uh, in his built environment and health research group, uh, it's a multidisciplinary team uh, that studies the intersection among our neighborhoods where we live, uh, business and social environments, and those that influence our health and their relationship with obesity and other health risks. He is a SUNY Binghamton graduate with his Bachelor of Science and completed his Master's in Public Health and Doctorate at the Columbia University. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Rundle. He's also one of the first people I ever met during my fellowship when I arrived at Columbia as a newbie. His work has always inspired me. He has contributed to the field of epidemiology in a phenomenal way. And he has incredible energy, which is contagious. And I'm sure you all really enjoy his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for making this event happen. Um, this morning, I learned a lot about molecules, uh, biomarkers, CT DNA, and to now we're going to zoom way the heck out from molecules and talk about neighborhoods. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the work we've been doing on urban design and how different features of urban design support health, particular, particularly physical activity and the maintenance of healthy weight, and then in turn how that might have an impact on obesity-related cancers. Um, so we're going to be spending a Bit of time speaking about obesity and overweight. Um, the definition of overweight and obesity put forth by WHO is is an abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that pre uh, presents a risk to health. Okay, so that's the clinical definition. Um, our most common sort of like operation, operization, operationalization, I can't even say that, <laughs> of obesity is BMI. So we use this really crude measure, body mass index, um, to classify people as experiencing normal weight, overweight, or obesity. And it is essentially the ratio of weight to height squared. Um, and so if the BMI is under 18.5, a person is labeled as underweight. If it's 18.5 to 24.9, they're labeled as normal weight. And if it's above, greater than or equal to 30, they're labeled as obese. And so I weigh 209 pounds, I'm six foot one. That gives me a BMI of 27.6, really comfortably in the middle of the overweight zone. So I would be labeled as overweight. Um, and obesity is important for cancer uh, for several reasons. Um, so IARC and NCI have linked obesity causally to increased risk for 13 cancers. And so analyses of the attributable risk and attributable proportion that have been done suggest that amongst those who are 30 years or older, annually we see roughly 37,000 new cancers in men and 74,000 new cancers in women that can be attributed to overweight or obesity. And then on the global, uh, uh, sort of the global stage, it's been estimated that about 3.9% of all cancers globally can be attributed to overweight or obesity. Now, physical activity is associated with lower risk of uh, seven types of cancers. And interestingly, it appears that the way that physical activity prevents cancer is not only by lowering the risk for obesity or lowering, lowering fat mass. Physical activity has protective uh, effects outside of sort of just burning calories and preventing overweight or preventing obesity. Um, you've probably all seen maps like this produced by the CDC. This is the most recent one I could find for 2020. This is the map of the prevalence of obesity in America uh, for adults. And you see a lot of red and orange. And the reds and the oranges are areas where 30 to 40% of individuals or adults um, have reported their height and weight such that we would calculate a BMI of obesity. 
um, hidden within these maps are tremendous disparities uh, by race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status. So I pulled some New York City data. This is the most recent New York City data um, from the surveys done in New York City, uh, which is 2018 data. And what I've done here is just plotted the percent of adults experiencing obesity by race, ethnicity, and sex. And so what you can see by race and sex and ethnicity, these disparities in the prevalence of people who are experiencing uh, obesity. And we see the highest prevalences amongst uh, black women and Hispanic women. Uh, there's almost no uh, disparity by sex amongst uh, whites. And then we see these gender and race disparities across these groups. If you take the same data and then plot it by household income, um, so the blue bars are men. So there's basically very little trend in income and body weight or BMI amongst men. But amongst women, you see this downward trend, higher income, um, lower prevalence of obesity. And these are the 2018 data. I've analyzed these data going back sort of year after year. So this exact trend can be plotted in the 2002 data from New York City. So this is a long-standing trend that you see over and over again in the New York City data. So we have these disparities in the experience of obesity, race, ethnicity, sex, gender, income. What about physical activity? So this is the national data for meeting uh, health-based recommendations for physical activity. Um, from 1997 to 2019, we sort of max out at 23% of the population actually meeting the recommendations for physical activity. So we're not doing great on uh, this metric either. This is the national map for meeting the recommendations for physical activity based on health. And that recommendation is 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity. And so you can see places where like, you know, less than 20% of people are meeting these uh, goals. And you can plot percent obesity versus percent people uh, meeting physical activity recommendations and do a scatter plot and see this very sharp correlation between the prevalence of the experience of obesity and the prevalence of people who actually uh, meet these health-based goals for physical activity. And you can flip through my si slides and you can see that the states that have the darkest red color for obesity have the lightest blue color for physical activity. Uh, Colorado is a standout. Colorado has always been like one of the highest physical activity states in our country. Um, one of the things that we've seen using the National Health Interview Survey data is that the prevalence of obesity has increased more rapidly amongst cancer survivors than it has increased in the general population. So I have some graphs here split for uh, women and men, and as I project these slides, I realize our color choices were not great. So the pale blue line down here is uh, the trend in... Uh, individuals without a reported history of cancer. The other colored lines are the trends in individuals with a reported history of cancer. And particularly for colorectal cancer, you see this sharp divergence between the lines for the prevalence of obesity in these two populations. And you see it in both um, men and women. And so the population of cancer survivors um, is, uh, the prevalence of obesity is growing faster in that population than in the population without a reported history of cancer. If we look at this by race ethnicity, what we have here is the blue lines are women, the yellow lines are men, the dotted lines are without a history of cancer, and the solid lines are with a history of cancer. So amongst Hispanics in the National Health Interview Survey, the blue dotted line and the blue solid line are actually pretty parallel. It's not showing a massive uh, disparity. And likewise, the yellow lines, there's some divergence in those lines, but they're not so far from parallel. Amongst African Americans, though, we see sort of this is where we see this real um, movement away from parallel lines, right? So the prevalence of obesity is accelerating as depicted by the solid lines. Um, amongst non Hispanic whites, um, you know, these lines all sort of jumble together and fall on top of each other. Um, they're basically parallel. And so, uh, Amongst non-Hispanic blacks, it's, this is where we seem to have this disparity growing between the prevalence of obesity among survivors versus those without a history of cancer. And this is important because obesity has implications for cancer survivorship. Um, 
And so the experience of obesity as a survivor can worsen a number of cancer-related outcomes. So reduced quality of life, higher cancer recurrence and higher cancer progression, worse survival outcomes, and then higher risk of certain secondary, second primary cancers. Um, and then for breast cancer survivors, colorectal cancer survivors, and prostate cancer survivors, physical activity after diagnosis is associated with lower cancer-specific mortality. So both physical activity and uh, adiposity in the survivorship context are important elements of the cancer survivorship experience. Now we zoom out to neighborhoods. Um, so the basic idea of how built environments and social environments might affect obesity is, is pretty simple. Um, the places where we live, work, and play, the amenities, the physical structures, they influence physical activity patterns, they influence diet. And these environments can be supportive of physical activity, or they can make physical activity harder. They could be supportive of healthy diets, or they may not support healthy diets. And so the question my group pursues is, can we quantify and measure built in social environments, and then can we show how urban design decisions impact health behaviors? We've worked with this idea of walkability. Walkability is a concept that's come out of urban planning, and it describes a set of urban planning uh, choices and features that support physical activity, particularly pedestrian activity. And urban planners talk about the five D variables. So residential density, intersection density, land use mix, or the availability of destinations to walk to, subway stop density, and this concept of retail building floor area to retail land use. I could explain that to you, but it's kind of arcane. But it describes a kind of commercial and retail environment. And I grabbed two pictures here of a high walkability and a low walkability uh, image. The top one is from the Upper West Side and the bottom one is from Queens. And you can immediately see differences there. So on the Upper West Side, we've got high population density with apartment buildings. We've got land use mix. We have a mixing of commercial, retail, and residential. We have sidewalks bustling with activity. We have gridded streets. The picture from Queens, which I took from one of the uh, community district board websites out in Queens, um, single family homes, no mixing of residential and commercial space. Um, there's a car in every driveway and there's literally no sidewalk, right? So these are starkly different in how urban design is gonna support physical activity through pedestrian activity. You can also see the difference just throwing up a Google map, okay? So I've got a high walkability neighborhood on the top here, which is typified by high density, mixed land use, gridded streets, the uh, availability of public transportation. On the bottom, we have another neighborhood in Queens, and you can see the footprints of the single family home, so it's low population density. They have this street layout that's not very connected. It's hard to get from point A to point B. There's almost no stores or retail. The only thing there is Amy's balloons. So if you have a need for a balloon, you can definitely walk and you can satisfy that need of your daily living by going to the balloon store. But that is it. You're driving everywhere else. And so we can quantify walkability and we've created these indexes that measure walkability using these concepts for urban design. And we've created a number of data sets for New York City that plot out walkability across New York City. And we can now do this for the entire nation. Um, but in New York City, we can do this at super high resolution. So I do a lot of work in collaboration with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And so one of our first projects was to take the American, uh, the, um, community uh, health survey data that the city has and pool it for 2002 to 2006. And we looked at how features of the neighborhoods in New York City were associated with BMI. And I'm showing you the results of the regression models here where it's the difference in BMI as predicted by these variables. The dotted red line is the null, the red dots are the point estimates, and then the confidence intervals. And so what you see is that the amount of the zip code that is covered by large parks and small parks is statistically significantly associated with lower BMI. Uh, higher walkability is associated with lower BMI. Conditional on the amount of park space you have, the quality of the park, if the park is low quality, is associated with higher BMI, and the homicide rate is associated with a higher BMI. So this is some of our first work showing that you could take a bunch of urban design variables and show how they were associated with BMI in New York City. 
We also work with the Department of Health on a study that um, had GPS trackers and accelerometer physical activity uh, devices that residents of New York City carried around for a week that collected data basically every 10 seconds. And on the left panel, all of that red is the GPS data that was collected in this study. The data is so dense that you can basically map out the entire street work network of New York City just from the GPS data that was collected in this study. And on the right, I'm giving you an example of one of the ways we use this data. So we wanted to understand how New Yorkers use their neighborhood. So the circles each represent a one kilometer space around the person's residence. The dots represent their GPS activity, and the white areas represent the smallest polygon that can contain that GPS data. So we tried to segregate like a one kilometer space around their house into places they used and places they didn't use based on their GPS activity. And what we find is that in your neighborhood, your average New Yorker is going to use the most walkable portion of their neighborhood. And so this is the walkability score, index score, for the area that they actually used in their home neighborhood based on their GPS data versus the area that was in within one kilometer that they didn't use. And I've plotted the walkability index score and you can see it's significantly higher. And so what we're seeing here is walkability influences people's behavior and where they go in their neighborhoods. We also looked at their physical activity patterns. So what I've plotted here is a covariate adjusted predicted um, minutes of physical activity across quartiles of walkability in New York City. And you see this really nice upward trend as walkability increases, the amount of physical activity increases. The difference between the lowest and the highest quartile is 100 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. Now remember, your health-based recommendation is 150 minutes. So variance in neighborhood walkability accounts for two-thirds of the health-based recommendation for physical activity in this sample. So this is like, this is a huge effect size. Um, and so this association is really, really strong. Um, so this is all modern GIS data from the 2000s. We wanted to start linking GIS data to cohorts that have been in existence for decades. And so we had to figure out a way to use quite primitive, not very clean administrative data from like the 80s and 90s to start measuring physical uh, neighborhood walkability. And so we have started building metrics that we can roll back all the way to 1990. And we use population density, intersection density, the number of destinations for daily living, and rail transit. But realistically, population density and the destinations of daily living are the two pieces of data that we can readily get anywhere in America fairly easily. So we've ended up like with very intense work being able to use all four in some occasions. And then when we're going nationally, we end up only using these two metrics because we just don't have the resources to measure all of this everywhere for 30 years. So we partnered with New York Women's uh, Health Study. This is a cohort study of 14,000 women originally recruited between 85 and 91 um, at mam mammography screening centers in New York City. And we've got now the entire address history for this cohort is 400,000 400, addresses for these participants. And so we've been able to build a full cohort analysis of walkability that they experienced during follow-up in this cohort. Um, and at baseline, we use sort of our high-tech version, which has four metrics, and then for each year of follow-up, we use this um, sort of easier-to-measure measure that only has population density and destinations. But these two metrics are highly correlated with each other. And so what did we see? Um, on this left panel, this is at baseline, so this is back in 1990, and what I'm doing here is plotting our neighborhood walkability index versus the self-report engagement in pedestrian activity and walking. And so what you can see here again is this trend as walkability goes up, the self-report of engagement in pedestrian activity goes up significantly. And then when we look at the BMI of the women when they were recruited into the study at baseline against the walkability of the neighborhood they lived in, again, what you see is this strong association between higher walkability and uh, lower BMI in this uh, cohort at baseline. So this is like way back in the late 80s, very early 90s. 
when we look at um, the hazard ratio for mort obesity related cancer mortality, so we take the baseline uh, walkability back in the 1990s and we use that to predict cancer related mortality for obesity related cancers. And what we see is that neighborhood walkability at baseline predicts lower risk of um, mortality from these obesity related cancers. And so this is sort of like the first finding that we had it was like, all right, this is what was happening at baseline. What happened to these individuals through 30 years of follow-up? Maybe they didn't just always live in this neighborhood. So we started looking at creating an annual metric for walkability throughout follow-up in this cohort. And so here is the average annual neighborhood walkability throughout follow-up for all of the women in the cohort. And again, what you see here, this is the risk of obesity-related cancers. And as neighborhood walkability increases, the risk of uh, diagnosis of an obesity-related cancer significantly declines. If we just zoom in on postmenopausal breast cancer, which is sort of like the archetype for a uh, obesity-related cancer, again, we see the same association. So the hazard ratio for um, diagnosis of postmenopausal breast cancer goes down significantly as neighborhood walkability or the experience of walkability goes up through time. So this is the first set of work really showing that an urban design feature measured over 30 years uh, with exquisite follow-up of where people lived is associated with lower mortality from obesity-related cancers and lower incidence of obesity-related cancers. We've done a little bit of work on cancer survivorship. So I'm involved in two cancer survivor cohorts that are both focused on African Americans. The first is Detroit Rocks, which is 2,089 African American cancer survivors living in the Detroit area. Um, they have a first invasive breast, prostate, or colorectal cancer. Um, and we measured BMI at the initial recruitment into the cohort, which was about 20 months after diagnosis. The other study is the Women's Circle of Health follow-up study, which is a cohort of African-American breast cancer survivors. Um, baseline data collection was roughly 10 months after diagnosis, and they've had a follow-up now. So 12 months after that, there was a follow-up, and then once again, they collected height and weight to measure BMI. So in our Detroit cohort, looking at just one BMI time point, so the first BMI that we were able to collect after diagnosis, Again, we're seeing the same thing that we've seen over and over again, that neighborhood walkability is associated with lower BMI. And so what I'm plotting here is the difference in the BMI of the cancer survivors by neighborhood walkability after adjusting for these various variables. And again, neighborhood walkability is inversely associated with BMI. The nice thing about the second study is we were able to look at uh, weight gain and weight loss after uh, diagnosis. And so what I'm plotting here is the risk of weight gain after diagnosis um, based on the density of walkable destinations. So walkable destinations is like all the stuff that you need to go and do, like banking, shopping, that you could walk to in your neighborhood as opposed to living in a neighborhood where the only way you could do that is to drive somewhere. So places that have got all of these amenities we need for our daily lives are much more walkable than places where you have to get in your car and like drive to the plaza or the mall or whatever. And what we show here is that as this sort of walkable environment increases, the risk of weight gain goes down significantly again. So now we have two data points um, showing that walkable environments are associated with lower adiposity amongst cancer survivors, amongst African-American cancer survivors, where we actually see the biggest disparity in weight gain uh, post-diagnosis. So follow-up on these cohorts is ongoing, so I'm hoping to have many more dots to plot in the future as we like, start plotting out trajectories of weight gain in these populations through time. And so the conclusions I have thus far is our work and that of many others shows a consistent association between higher neighborhood walkability and higher levels of physical activity, lower BMI, uh, lower obesity risk, and less weight gain through time. Uh, this is the first data that I'm aware of showing that neighborhood walkability is associated with a cancer outcome, and in this case, multiple cancer outcomes in terms of mortality, incidence, and survivorship experience. Um, and you know, based on our work in the National Health Interview Study is the African-American cancer survivor population that seems to experience um, the, the highest uptick in weight gain. And so we're showing here that urban design seems to be associated with a lower risk of weight gain. 
And again, this supports urban design policies that support physical activity, right? And so every urban designer, every city government is making choices about how to spend money to build and rebuild and refurbish cities. We're trying to build the evidence base that you can use design decisions to support health through physical activity. Um, and we've had some luck translating this into policy. And so we worked really closely with the New York City Department of Health. And so our findings immediately sort of flow into the Department of Health. And so we've authored uh, data briefs that the New York City Commissioner of Health publishes on design and physical activity. Um, our findings are part of the scientific basis for the current urban design and building guidelines that have been set by New York City government. Um, one of the things about New York City is when New York City sets a policy, like other municipalities tend to download that policy and enact it. So this policy for physical activity support through design is now sort of being used by lots of other cities. Um, our work is used by for-profit design companies as part of certification programs for healthy design um, and also not-for-profit organizations that put together certificate programs. So I'm an advisor to the Well Certificate Program and I'm advisor to the Center for Active Design on their FitWell Certificate Program. So we're actively trying to turn this into policy decisions but also get this information into the commercial building, the commercial design, the commercial architecture world as well. Um, this is a huge team effort. Um, this is a small smattering of the team, doesn't even include my students who have been working on these projects. Um, but this is a giant team effort that brings together urban planners, urban sociologists, biostatisticians, geographers, epidemiologists, environmental health scientists. Um, and we've been lucky enough to be funded and supported by NIH and foundations and supported by colleagues who have these beautiful cohort studies that we work with. So thank you. And I hope I'm on time. I might be a little ahead of time. <laughs> that was an excellent talk. Thank you very much. What a, what a great presentation. I wanted to uh, open the floor up for questions, uh, both for those of you here in person and for our uh, Zoom audience. Um, but I'll just get things started. Um, I had a question regarding the, the one slide that you showed regarding the fact that only 23% of US adults meet the physical activity recommendations. So as we think about different racial uh, and ethnic minority groups, does that same statistic apply or does that change by group? And then in a, in a follow-up question, what does the walkability look like in some of these neighborhoods? And uh, is there less uh, opportunity for getting activity and how does that impact obesity in, in, in these minority populations? Thanks. Um, sure, thank you. Good questions. Um, okay. Okay. I, I've, ne I've never actually pulled apart the physical activity data by sociodemographics, in part because a lot of the survey data doesn't have great measures of physical activity. Like, it's super easy in a phone survey to get people to report their height and weight, but then doing the kind of survey that is required to gather all the information you would need to figure out if somebody has met those requirements. So we have a lot less data, really, on um, physical activity. Um, and New York City has published its data, makes it super easy to look at it by um, all of these sociodemographic variables. Um, but it's less easy to do that for physical activity. Um, it would not shock me at all if that 23% figure was different for people of different backgrounds, incomes, and uh, situations. Um, the question on what does walkability look like in different places? So, sort of one of the critiques that anybody in this room should be able to throw at me is, you know, let's talk about fundamental causes, right? So let's talk about income, poverty, and how have I tried to adjust for confounding for that, right? Like, so we put into all of our models uh, measures of individual level SES and neighborhood level SES, so measures of poverty, income, median household income. But the other thing to think about really is that like, some of our neighborhoods that are relatively low income are actually much, much more walkable 
than our wealthier neighborhoods. So if you think about some of the wealthier, um, more suburban neighborhoods of Queens, they actually aren't that walkable when you compare them to, say, 125th Street and um, Amsterdam. So tons of retail, tons of subway, gridded streets. So one of the things we see is that wealthier neighborhoods actually have sort of lower walkability metrics when we talk about walkability from these purely urban design concepts. And so this kind of flips the usual environmental disparities story on its head. We usually think of low-income neighborhoods, communities of color as having more pollution, right? More of these negative environmental features. And we think about environmental justice. But when it comes to urban design for walkability, it actually turns out that it's very common for disadvantaged neighborhoods that are disadvantaged in other ways to actually have higher levels of walkability. And that flips our confounding story on its head. The experience of walking in a wealthy neighborhood versus a low-income neighborhood may be quite different, though, right? So one of the things that we sort of link with low-income neighborhoods is higher crime rates. And so often we actually have data on crime rates, and so we can adjust for that. And so when urban planners talk about walkability, they're really talking about a design construct. They're not talking about so much an experience construct, right? They're talking about, like, we're going to build some stuff. Mm -hmm. They're not talking about how we craft this so that it has these other aesthetic qualities or the way you feel about it. Um, so we do our best to adjust for social determinants of health. Um, there's always going to be residual confounding, but we also sort of take comfort from this idea that the, the script has been flipped, that disadvantaged neighborhoods often are more walkable, and that changes our sense of confounding and how things may get biased. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting. That is an interesting point to think about because people higher income can join a gym. They can get exercise, but there's also something called the active couch potato. Yeah. The person that says they exercise, they tick the box that they work out and they ride their bike to work, but they sit for eight hours and right. then ride their bike home and they call themselves exercisers. And then you have someone else in, in, in uh, the you know, west side of New York walking all day long and they would never check the box that they exercise. They're just living. Right, they're just doing their daily living <laughs> activities, Correct. right? Yeah. Correct. Um, and I think that like sedentary behavior is not at the opposite end of the scale of physical activity. It's like it's an orthogonal scale. It's a separate thing, right? Yeah. So I did my 30 minutes on the treadmill this morning, and I walked here from the subway station, but I've been sitting all day, and I probably count as sedentary. But that's on a different sort of dimension than the fact that I hit my health-based recommendation for physical activity this morning. Correct. Which has all types of implications for measurement error, as we know in epidemiology studies. Yep. Um, so very, very, thank you for answering my questions. Are there other questions in the audience? Thank you so much for um, give us this, giving us this spatial setting. How do you account for um, so air quality? So when people walk outside, they're also exposed to air quality, and therefore it might in some places be safer to drive. And then also in New York City, we have the inequitable distribution of street uh, trees, meaning that people who have higher walkability in the summer also have much greater exposure to the sun, and therefore walking may not be healthy. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot to unpack there. So on the air pollution front, um, I think it's on LinkedIn, maybe it's on Facebook, but there is a discussion between myself in the public chat uh, between myself and an air pollution researcher questioning our results. Um, so higher walkability tends to be associated with higher air pollution. And his argument was that air pollution is associated with cancer, right? But it's an inverse confounding triangle, not to get deep into the epi methods weeds, but we're showing that walkability has got a negative association with cancer. Walkability is positively associated with air pollution. Air pollution is positively associated with cancer. So our failure to adjust for air pollution is probably functionally a bias towards the null. And so if we were able to control for air pollution over 30 years across the entire country, we're expecting to actually see a stronger effect of walkability because of the way of those correlations matrices would work. Um, and it's interesting, right? Like you could say, well, if I go walking on a busy street and I'm sucking down all that air pollution, that can't be good for me. On the other hand, it appears that physical activity is so good for you 
that it seems to offset Trump or outweigh whatever you want, however you want to say it, like physical activity still seems to win as a protective effect. Um, yeah, street trees. <laughs> One of the things that street trees do is they keep air pollution concentrated at the ground level in New York City because street tree canopy acts as a ceiling and then you've got the canyon walls of the buildings on either side. So street trees are actually associated with higher ground level pollution. Um, they do make a nicer walking environment though. Um, so I could definitely see like green space and street trees being positively associated with more walking. And we've done some work that bears that out. Um, what we have seen is that park space is good for lower BMI, but not on the same order of magnitude as walkability. And so parks in New York City are destinations for physical activity. They're also destinations for laying around and doing nothing. Um, they're also destinations for eating, like the, some of these parks with like amazing food trucks. And so like teasing all that apart when you do a study of green space is kind of hard. Um, not everybody goes to the park to exercise, um, but they are destinations for exercise. <laughs> so I hope that was somewhat useful in answering your questions. Uh-oh. Excellent presentation, thank you. Um, and I really appreciate the slide where you're showing the translation to policy. I think it's really important. Um, one of the questions that I had was actually about measures, other alternative measures of adiposity instead of BMI, because we know body mass index is not necessarily the best measure of adiposity across racial and ethnic groups. So have you thought about, or have you done any work looking at the relationship between um, walkability and some of the measures of the design features of neighborhoods um, and how they might relate to things like waist-to-hip waist ratio mm -hmm. and even measures of adipose tissue distribution, say from CT scans. And that, that's a question because I'm actually doing a study like that right now that I think would be really interesting to look at, looking at um, adipose tissue distribution. We have looked at waist circumference in the regards cohort, and we actually figure, find a bigger impact on waist circumference than BMI, and the regards cohort is an older age cohort where there's some sort of like loss of muscle mass and gain of fat mass, and waist circumference is actually more strongly associated with walkability in, in, a, in a good way. Um, I was very skeptical of BMI for a long time. Um, I've become less skeptical. I think that um, we did a paper where we took a huge clinical data set and we could measure body composition, percent fat, percent muscle, waist to hip. We basically took every measure that was in the literature that we could measure that depicted adiposity and then looked to see which of these measures was the strongest predictor of blood pressure, uh, cholesterol, uh, blood sugar, and they were all basically the same and none of them did any materially better than BMI in this huge clinical data set. And so that made me feel a lot more comfortable about sort of thinking about BMI as a, as a measure I wanted to measure. Um, I would also say that in large population studies, we, I mean, the argument against BMI is it doesn't, muscle, doesn't measure fat, uh, muscle mass, right? Like you could always say, well, I'm heavy because I have a lot of muscle. That's obviously why I am in the uh, overweight category. Um, on a large population scale, like New York City, we do not have an epidemic of buffness, right? Like that's not what we see clinically is an epidemic of just like musculature, right? And I think within the setting that we're in, BMI works quite well. And it has all these drawbacks, absolutely. It doesn't actually measure the thing I want to measure. But as a proxy measure, it does good and it's really predictive of future health outcomes as good as anything else that I could possibly measure in 10,000 people, right? Um, so that's my thought on BMI. And no, it's not a great measure. It doesn't measure the thing I want to measure, but it does measure something that's important. I also really enjoy your talk. 
I have a sort of question comment. Um, it's um, have you compared with other cities around the world? Because, like, uh, of course, in Europe, it's much more cities are more workable, but also villages. But there is something that um, I was commenting with my friend, who is also from Spain. So over there, women, postmenopausal women, are always working in groups. I mean, there is culturally in many countries all these walks that people do after a certain age. So I'm interested as well to see if there is, you know, and is there anything in addition culturally in some cities in the US, uh, in some behaviors, you know, I, I think there is a lot there that could, you know, be impact. I mean, you know, the vast expanse of America is not very walkable. Um, so this, the study from the NYU Women's Health Study, um, these were individuals recruited from Connecticut, New York State, uh, New Jersey, so lots of suburban areas. And then through time, many of these individuals moved to like Florida and like some of our typical retirement states. And so we were able to sort of have like a fairly strong diversity. It wasn't like everybody was from like Manhattan. So we had fairly strong diversity of um, uh, uh, spaces. And then the regards cohort, which I haven't shown, the regards cohort is a national study. Um, and it gives us like all kinds of walkable environments. Um, and we've published analyses there showing that uh, walkability is associated with uh, lower weight at follow up and smaller waist circumferences. I think like social norms, like you're explaining, of, of groups of people going out for a walk together, I think that just like you know, as a, as a social intervention, I love it. Um, if that could be combined with sort of urban design that made that a better, even better experience, that would be um, that would be great. Um, you know, my my work is very much focused on crunching very very large data sets in sort of very abstract ways, and I don't really do a lot of like intervention studies or uh, behavior change studies. You know. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Thank you for your talk today. I have a question and also a comment. My question is the slide that you spoke about women uh, at survivors of cancer um, being overweight. Um, my question is, do they gain weight after they finish treatment or these women were already heavy before? Um, and then my comment is, I thought it was interesting the slide you had of people of different um, economic circumstances, and generally the women had more obesity than the men until the very rich, that the men popped up. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know if you knew about that, if you uh, looked into that. So for the last question first, um, we've seen the same phenomena for 20 years of data in New York City. It's amazing how stable that graph is. I think that, you know, the, the story of socioeconomic status and weight in women is in part a story of stigmatization of uh, body. It's in part a story of um, there's a significant bias in hiring and pay raises for women who are um, have a larger body size. And so there's sort of like a loop going on here. And I think for men, basically, if you're rich, there is no social stigma for being overweight. Like there is very little social pressure uh, for that. And I think that's why we see almost no impact of SES in men. And we see it only in women. And we see it over and over and over again. Um, sorry, you distracted me with the last question. The first question, again, give me the keyword. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. So um, in the National Health Interview Study, which was like the beginning of our work, it doesn't really let you, doesn't let us tease that out. Um, in the two survivor cohorts that we're working on, um, we're hoping to tease that out because we're hoping to have long-term follow-up where we can look at what happens before and after the end of treatment. Um, at the juncture we're at now, we don't really have it's a little fuzzy on how many people have finished treatment and we don't have like enough data points post-treatment to really like plot out trajectories. But the goal very much is to try and plot out the exact trajectories I imagine you would like to see. I just had maybe one final question <laughs> um, related to diet. So um, similar to you were talking about um, the walkability counters the pollution 
part. Um, we know diet plays a role in obesity. I wonder if walkability, if you've teased apart any, any data that took into account diet and walkability. So we've published papers where we've both measured the walkability environment metrics and food access uh, in terms of like fast food and grocery stores and so on. Um, on a national, if you look across the nation and you look at the literature published across the nation, there's very, very, few papers sh very few papers showing an association between food access near your home and uh, diet or body size, in part just because everybody just drives to the grocery store. In New York City, where car ownership is much lower, we actually do see associations between um, your immediate neighborhood food environment and diet and BMI. And it appears to be more about the availability of healthy food. So we didn't see any associations with the density of fast food. And I think that there's so much fast food in New York City that like one more Burger King in your neighborhood doesn't radically change your diet because you could still eat 21 meals in a week at a fast food joints. But we have much lower density of supermarkets and places where you can uh, buy healthy food. So there we actually saw an association where there was greater access to supermarkets was associated uh, with lower BMI. And as a result of that, we worked with New York City on their FRESH initiative, which was a series of uh, tax zoning uh, loan programs to get supermarkets to open up in underserved neighborhoods. I think we're up to 32 supermarkets have opened under the FRESH initiative. And so, you know, translation of research to policy, I went and testified at the US, uh, the city zoning board. They gave me two minutes to make my case that we should change the zoning laws in New York City to allow supermarkets to open in places where they typically wouldn't be allowed to open because of zoning. So I had to speak really fast for two minutes to make the case that zoning should be changed so we can open supermarkets so people could eat healthy. Um, so yeah, we, we worked to change zoning. And so now there are, uh, you know, we did a small part of that and New York City was able to change its incentive structure. So I think there are 30 odd supermarkets and grocery stores that have opened as a result of that. So what we found was healthy food, access to healthy food. We could see health benefits of that. The density of fast food was not associated with health outcomes. And I think it's just cause like you do a regression model where you're like, what is the effect of one more fast food joint on health when you already have 30 fast food joints, right? Like, you, you know, it doesn't really make that much difference. So, so we've done the work. Walkability still is the strongest predictor um, compared to green space or food access. Not that I don't think food access is important. I'm just saying in our data, it didn't show up as well. Are there any other questions in here on uh, anyone here on the Zoom? Any Zoom questions? No? Okay. All right. Dr. Rundle, thank you very, very much for that awesome thank presentation. You. Thank you all. And your incredible contributions to this field. Thank you.